um, to kind of help us learn and adapt and grow uh, in this new normal of, of working remotely, of kind of being confined to our homes. So really excited to bring you um, a fun topic every week. Uh, and so for the months of September and October, we have been partnering with a really wonderful organization called Eden Housing, um, who is a partner that we facilitate training for internally for their team. Um, but that also is just an amazing organization uh, that really helps to empower uh, low income families uh, throughout California. So all of the donations from this session go directly to uh, Eden Housing. And we have Alyssa who is on the team at Eden Housing and she's gonna be sharing a little bit more um, about that. Before that, I just wanna also say we'll be releasing the calendar for November for upcoming events. Uh, that will be coming out and emailed to you and available uh, in our community platform offsite um, after the session. So I'll speak on that after. Um, but before we get into today's session on storytelling, I want to invite uh, Alyssa to come on and share a little bit about Eden Housing and the work that they do. Thank you. Everybody. Good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Alyssa. I'm the Community Engagement and Volunteer Programs Manager with Eden. Um, so a little bit about Eden. We've been around for about 52 years now. Um, we're based primarily out of Hayward, but we have properties as far north as Sonoma County and as far south as San Diego County. Um, and we help to house um, low-income families, seniors, um, persons with disabilities or special needs. And now we are branching into veterans homes as well. Um, and we put the tenant relief fund in place um, at the beginning of our shelter in place here in California, um, just to help our residents kind of through their job loss or through the loss of their job hours. Um, and to date, we've helped nearly 500 families um, with uh, partial donations to their back rent. And so if you guys have any additional questions around the tenant relief fund or um, volunteering, because I also manage those programs um, for our properties, I'm happy to answer any questions you have um, later throughout the session. Um, but I'd also like to thank Carly for hosting me and Eden Housing for the last um, eight weeks. It's been an absolute joy to kind of walk through and learn through all of the uh, modules with you guys. As a thank you guys for hosting me, um, some of your names have now become familiar. So um, if you have any questions, I'm here throughout the session um, and I'm happy to share my email as well at the end. So thanks. Thank you so much, Alyssa. I'm going to really miss having you uh, on here every week. It's been really fun um, to have you and um, support support Eden Housing in this way. So again, if anyone has questions, please feel free to reach out to me um, and Alyssa after the session. Um, and with a $20, $20 donation, you also receive six months of free access to Learn It Anytime, which is Learn It's uh, on-demand platform for learning. So we have videos on everything from Excel and, you know, Excel exams um, to influencing without authority and more professional development topics. So um, get in touch with me around that. Uh, but we would love we would love your support on that. Um, and again, these sessions are really about learning and growing and also building community. So a big part of having you all here um, is really to support one another. So we really appreciate um, your support and really appreciate really appreciate your time and being here as well. Um, with that, I just want to introduce uh, Darren, our speaker, and uh, Learn It's Director of Leadership and Learning Solutions. Um, I've loved working with Darren. He's been on the team, I think, just about a month now, um, and he's one of our expert facilitators, so he works with a lot of our clients um, really closely uh, and has been a facilitator for, for leading learning and development organizations throughout his career um, and is also an experienced actor um, both uh, on stage and on screen. Uh, he was most recently um, in, oh my gosh, I'm forgetting the name of the movie, but he's, he's been in a lot of uh, movies that you may have seen him in inadvertently. Um, but anyways, Darren, I'll let you uh, share a little bit more about yourself and, and hand it over to you. Thanks so much. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Carly. Um, why, don't you, why don't I grab the screen controls here so I can put up uh, some slides because that's what we do. Um, okay, let me, let me get this set up. 
Uh, I actually feel like you did a pretty good job of describing who I am. Yeah, that's uh, really happy to be working with Learn It. It's a terrific organization. I've had the privilege of uh, doing some projects with um, with Eden Housing, and that's also been great. I just got to say that they're clearly such great people doing terrific work, and so it's a, it's a privilege to be here. We'll dive in here in just a second, but I want to make sure that uh, people are able to uh, first off see the screen that that looks good and that and you can interact with us through chat. Um, we're also happy to have actual conversations and pull you off mute and have a little bit of a conversation going if we get the opportunity. But right now, can you just make sure that uh, just uh, type into chat your favorite spooky story type into chat your favorite spooky story. And uh, that's just to make sure that we're all looking good with, with, uh, with the chat functionality. And thank you to those of you who came on the camera as well. And I just, I mean, I just have to call it out because I think it's Leanne, is that right? Leanne looks like she's joined us and uh, Leanne looks to be um, maybe 10. <laughs> thank you for being here. I really appreciate it. Hi, I didn't know we had, oh. All right, there you go. You're you're young. Thank you. I hope that this is exciting for you. I'll do my best to make it entertaining. Uh, uh, Carly, how does the chat situation look? You're all good. Yeah, we're receiving chat, so I'll, I'll monitor that, Darren. Awesome. So as I go through this, if you have questions, type them into chat. Carly will track those. She might answer it right, right away or we'll stop and we'll check in. And we want to make sure that, that you walk out of here today with real skills and tools and a, maybe just an, an upgraded understanding of how you can be applying storytelling out in the world. And with that, Halloween edition, right? I have to say my inclination was to show up with something Halloween-y. I actually wanted to like get fangs and a cape and do like a Bell Lugosi and do the whole thing like this, but I felt like uh, it was be too much and plus I couldn't, uh, my fangs didn't arrive. Further, I wanted to find a really good spooky business story that we could work on. Uh, sadly, the uh, the spooky business story situation, well, there's a lot of tragic stories out there, and there's some pretty horrific stories out there when it comes to business, but nothing really like a ghost story. So, uh, so I kind of had to let that go. But we will be talking about stories through the lens of a business setting. And by the end, hopefully you'll have these new tools that you can work on, and you can apply them to Halloween-y business stories that you find on your own. So why are stories so powerful? What is it about stories? <clears throat> Storytelling is a bit of a buzzword. Everyone wants to tell great stories like Bill and Melinda Gates or Oprah, uh, Jeff Bezos, Sheryl Sandberg, Richard Branson, Malala uh, Yousafzai, uh, Yousafzai, I think is how you say it. Experts regularly tout the importance of storytelling as a key skill for leaders right up there with decision making, strategic planning, negotiation. In my own work, I've had a lot of uh, clients come to me uh, all over asking for help with uh, their stories and really getting their narrative right. People recognize that storytelling is this really powerful tool. So what is it about storytelling? Why is it so powerful? Well, let's take a look at the chemistry of what happens in your brain. And we'll, we'll go to neuroscience for help with this. According to neuroscientists and neuroeconomists like Paul Zak, who did some pioneering research on the prosocial aspects of oxytocin, here's what happens inside your brain when you hear a great story. First, if you connect to a character, a character that's sympathetic, it triggers a synthesis of oxytocin, the so-called love hormone, which makes you care. The cool thing about oxytocin too, in that research that Paul Zak did, is that when you have this experience of a great story and oxytocin is, is being uh, triggered in your brain and synthesized, you are more likely at the end of that story uh, to be charitable, for example, if it was a story of, uh, that was emotionally heartwarming. It has lasting effects. Stories also produce cortisol, the stress hormone. That's part of what keeps you engaged and excited on the edge of your, of your seat. A good story also uh, releases dopamine. A happy ending, this is the happy hormone, right at the ending, if you feel warm and satisfied with the whole experience, which is kind of what we want to uh, lean towards when you're telling business stories, uh, that you end on a hopeful note and you carry that with you afterwards. All of this increases your uh, retention, your ability to remember the story, to have that emotional experience, and to, uh, and to act 
afterward. Stories lead to action. So there's this roller coaster of emotion and brain activity happening when you absorb a good story. Under an MRI, everything lights up. What goes on in your brain when you're just receiving info, data, facts, figures? Uh, crickets, not a whole lot. I mean, look, that's not entirely true. Certainly your brain is, is, is having some activity when you absorb information, but it's not the same. So that's what neuroscience has to say. What do behavioral and cognitive scientists have to say? Even with 86 billion neurons, trillions of synapses firing in your brain every second, you still cannot process all of the information that you're receiving internally and externally from the world. There's just simply too much. Um, couple that with the fact that you have to remember uh, salient details that you pull out of the world and you have to take in all that information and be able to apply it as you move forward. It's too much. So your brain has come up with a very clever shorthand and that is stories. Stories are a simple tool for making sense of the world. They give things meaning and context. Stories are how we remember information. They help us make those decisions. They help us know what to care about. They're how we pass on historical, cultural, family, personal information if that information really needs to be remembered and acted on. Here, so here's the point. If data is how we hold information, stories are how we give that information meaning. And all of us are made to process the world through stories. That's what it means to be a human, really. And let's demonstrate this with a quick little experiment. This experiment comes from uh, Daniel Kahneman and Amos Tversky, who are considered the, uh, the uh, grandfathers of behavioral economics. All those cognitive biases that you hear about, a lot of this research was really done by both Kahneman and Tversky. So if you would, uh, well, I tell you what, let me ask Carly just to get her a little bit involved here. Would you uh, read this out loud? And then I, I'd like everyone to just consider the question and type into chat, uh, which one you think is Steve more likely to be a librarian or a farmer? Carly, let's hear you read this out loud. Absolutely. Steve is very shy and withdrawn, invariably helpful, but with little interest in people or the world of reality. A meek and tidy soul, he has a need for order and structure and a passion for detail. Is Steve more likely to be a librarian or a farmer? All right. Let's, uh, let's see what our guesses look like. I know, honestly, I didn't even think about, it. we should have done a poll here. That makes a lot more sense. But uh, you're receiving all these chats. Everybody's seen them, hopefully. Uh, Carly, I know that you're a math whiz. Can you give me a quick total on the precise, uh, the precise percentage for each? Yes, I would say it's actually pretty 50-50. Um, I would say I'm getting a couple more. <laughs> One person says a data analyst, but... Um, I would say it's actually probably about 60% farmer, 40% librarian. Awesome. Can we, um, can we hear from uh, one person who says librarian and one person who says farmer? If you're up for just uh, explaining, you're making your case, uh, shoot up a hand or Carly will pick on someone that she feels like she knows uh, might be game for just telling us. We're looking for one person to make the case for librarian and one person to make the case for farmer. Can we, can we pull this off, Carly? Yes, let's see. I can either call on someone. Um, let's see. Linda Shale raised her hand. Okay, great. Linda, what do you think? Sorry, I had to unmute myself. Yeah, I picked you. librarian because I thought that um, being disconnected or it, you know the world of reality, he, with the books, he would he would be able to stay in that. Yeah, it feels right, right? It, it just feels yeah. like Steve would appreciate being a librarian. It just feels like the right environment for Steve for uh, for all those reasons, right? Excellent. Yes. I, 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 good case, case well made. Um, does anyone have an alternate case for why you think Steve really should be a farmer? If you have something, raise a hand. Otherwise, uh, maybe we'll have Carly just grab somebody. I think there's good reasons for, for, for us to consider Steve might be a farmer as well. Carly, what do we got? Uh, is Stephanie, Stephanie Mecklein, are you comfortable coming offline or coming off, off mute? Stephanie said farmer. Let's see. Farmer, yeah.
All right, I oh, can pick. Oh, okay. okay. Hi, Stephanie. <laughs> Hi. Um, just because all the librarians that I know are very, very interested in people and have to be in order to help them, and they actually love interacting with people, help them find the either um, the book they need for reference or just for the love of reading. So, Stephanie, thank you. That's like uh, some expert insight right there. Um, much appreciate, much appreciated. Maybe our, our uh, stories about uh, librarians are actually off in the first place. Um, Carly, I think I think we need to get uh, people on mute here to back on mute. Thanks so much, both of you, for participating. So, can everybody hear me right now? Yeah, yeah. Push, push that today. But uh, we still have a couple of people if you yeah, okay, good, now we're good. All right, thank you for playing along with this little uh, activity right here. Here is the uh, story about behind this. Logic, pure logic logic would always give you just one answer every single time. If you, if you fed this into a machine and you said, which one is Steve? The machine would always say farmer every single time. And that is because there are five times more farmers. Well, that's in the U.S. than there are anywhere else. But I believe there's probably more farmers all over the world than there are librarians. It's, it's, it's sort of an open and shut case in terms of just pure logic. But that's not how we work. We pick up on a story immediately. Um, uh, uh, what feels like Steve, that's what motivates us. So whether you're looking at Steve to be a farmer or a librarian, the case always comes down to um, behavior, to the story. What we're looking for is story logic, not logic logic. And we're made to look for that right away. So uh, so that's the, the big idea here. We're looking at a couple of things that make stories so powerful. It's an emotional journey, and we are hardwired to look for stories because that's how we hold meaning. So if all that's true, then uh, what is the key to telling a great story? Uh, what we're going to look at is some principles and tools for creating good stories. Then we're going to circle back to business stories. But if you, if you had to boil everything down into just like one key thing, what makes a great story? Uh, here's what it is. It's the ability to transport your listeners. Poets, writers, dramatists, screenwriters, psycholinguists all refer to this as being transported into a story. And you know that feeling when you feel lost in a story. You sort of lose track of, of anything else that's going on around you and your imagination is activated and you see the story unfold. Maybe not literally like pictures, but, but you have that feeling of seeing it happen before you. That's when you're immersed in the story. And here's the key thing. The degree to which your, your story transports your listeners is the degree to which your story is successful. The more transported, the better. And uh, in a business story, that's certainly what you're looking to try to create. Now, in order to get people transported into your story, we have a big hurdle to overcome, and that is their attention. There's so many demands on all of our attention every day. There's products and things and people all trying to get you to focus on them. And we have pretty short attention spans. In fact, uh, the average person today in, in just any sort of industrialized society is bombarded by 6,000 to 10,000 ads per day. We're checking on average our phone screens. This not having a call, but the screens two to three hours a day. It's 300 phone checks, like average, but it can be up to 800 times you're checking your phone and you're, you're scanning through things and moving on to something new every 10 to 20 seconds. So grabbing someone's attention and holding it is a, is a key uh, hurdle that you have to get over if you're going to tell that great story, story that's going to transport people in and, and keep them engaged for more than 10 seconds. And when you do that, what you're looking for, once you get their attention, is to take them on a journey. That's what we're really looking for here. Here's two things that you want to have to take people on a great journey. And that is uh, great characters really interesting characters. Uh, research shows that character-driven stories with emotional content result in better understanding of key points that a speaker wishes to make, and it enables better recall later on. That, again, comes from research by Paul Zak that you can find in a great article called Why Your Brain Loves Good Storytelling. Um, it wants to be that, that character. You, you also 
want to have essentially one character that really draws you in, somebody you can empathize with. It doesn't mean that they do everything perfect, but it's somebody that, that draws you in. It's, it's sort of a sad but true thing that stories about millions of people um, tend not to be as compelling as a story about a single person even though the, arguably the tragedy is obviously so much worse. So you're looking for those stories where you can grab a hold of a person. Now, it is possible to have a story that can be not about a person, but about a business, uh, a company, a product, or a thing. But it, it's often really better to have an actual person behind that story that you can connect to. So that's one piece. Here's the other piece that you want to have to really transport people. Your story, if you're going to take people on a journey and it wants to be interesting, how are you going to keep people engaged? It's through curiosity. What your story should do is pose interesting questions without completely answering them. What you want the questions to do is to open up more questions and not once, but repeatedly. I'll give you an example. I had a client uh, who was a, a moving into a, a higher leadership role. And they're telling me a story about being a uh, top golfer at a division one school. He was a star player. He was kind of cocky about it. He had, you know, he thought he was amazing. He was a loner. He didn't need anybody's help. And it was his freshman year. And he stood over a putt that would have secured a championship for the whole team. And if I really tell the story, you know what happens next, because it has to follow a story logic. This person is set up for a fall. So yes, he missed the putt. Um, and, and now we kind of know what story we're in. But if you're telling a good story with good characters and, and, you're, and you're doing a good job with it, people want to know, okay, great, what happens next? Um, this is what Hollywood calls surprising familiarity. You're balancing things that feel like they have a story logic, but they surprise you just a little bit and they keep you on this path of, of asking and answering questions. So what could happen next in that story? He misses the putt in his freshman year. Well, could have gone all kinds of ways. Could have been that he never picks up a golf club again and really, you know, goes to rock bottom. Uh, it could be that he uh, has to reassess his his behavior and how he is in the world and become more of a team player, and then uh, stands over that same putt three years later to win the championship for his team as a senior. But what actually helps him do it is that now he's a team player, and that is actually the story that uh, my client told at that point, which is a pretty good story. So. There you go. This is, uh, these, are, these are two key things that you want to have in a story is to transport your listeners and have uh, great characters um, supported by this, this, uh, quest these questions like this. Let me actually put this up on the screen. Here's what we've looked at. Stories take you on an emotional journey. They hold meaning. A great story will transport your listeners. That's how you know if it's successful. And it's great characters and great questions. We're going to head from here into more specifically what you can do to create great stories. So it, we're going to get more granular with, with actual tools and skills. But let's pause for just a moment for me to check in with Carly and see, uh, do we have any questions about this so far? Um, thoughts, concerns? Carly, how are we looking? Yeah, Darren, we, we have one question um, from Lars around just when building, when you're building your own narrative, um, any good techniques, and maybe you'll get into this too, Darren, but techniques to tailor it to kind of like, if you're, if you're looking to give people a certain takeaway, any techniques to kind of tailor so that you're guiding people to the takeaways you kind of want them to get out of it? Yes. Thank you. So uh, I, hopefully this will get picked up when we talk about a little bit more, Lars. But if you know the point that you want to make, then you're looking for examples in your own life, in things that you've read out in the world. You can pull stories from anywhere, but you're looking for something that feels like it makes that case. Then you want to sort of reverse engineer it. If you can take a little bit of artistic license, go for it and set up the opposite of the point that you want to make. In this case, the point that we wanted to make with, the, with my former client was um, the value of, being, uh, of working together as a team. That was the message that he wanted to impart to his team. So he, he went back to something that allowed him to be kind of humble in front of everyone else, where he was not that way. So you're looking for kind of extremes. Find a good example that makes your point and then see if you can tease out the extremes of it so you have a bigger journey for people. Um, 
Hopefully that made sense. Lars and everyone else, let's, let's push ahead a little bit. And we, if you have a great question, jump in. Carly will stop me and we'll have time for some more questions at the end. So here we go. This is where we're headed next. Uh, we're going to look at story structure very specifically. I'm going to give you three tips for telling stories. And then we'll look at specific examples of when and where you can tell stories for business. Uh, <clears throat> I, I grew up in the seventies and eighties, well, sixties really, but anyway, in the 1970s, uh, Star Wars was a super big thing, came out in 1977 and then it was like 81, 83 and generated a lot of interest in, uh, what might've otherwise been a fairly obscure academic, Joseph Campbell. And that's because, um, George Lucas credited Joseph Campbell's theories on what he, uh, what, what he called the, uh, monomyth for helping him tell this story. So here's what that was about. Um, uh, Joseph Campbell was a, a comparative mythology and comparative religion professor. And he came up with this theory called the archetypal hero theory. And he said that there's really just one story that everybody tells the world over in every culture, in every mythology that really motivates people. And it's a story that we're looking for. Um, this is that monomyth right here. I think there's 18 steps. This is Joseph Campbell's life work. And it's what George Lucas based Star Wars on. And it's great for epic stories like a Gilgamesh or Lord of the Rings, but it's probably a little bit too much for stories that you might tell, especially in a business setting. So we're gonna simplify this and just grab a hold of a more classic three act structure with the beginning, a middle and an end. But the basic flow of this monomyth that you, you sort of have a hero who uh, has a flaw and needs to learn something and then grows as a result of what they learn. And then you have this satisfying feeling of some success. That is a very motivating story in a business setting. So we are kind of looking for the backbone of this, but we're, we're going to look at it through the lens of a simpler construct. So here you go. Act one, people need information right up front. So the first thing you want to do is give them the who, when, where, and what's changed. Give them the information, give them the setup. If you're watching a movie, this would be called an establishing shot. When you go from one location to another location, they very quickly show you like the outside of the building or something. People need to orient where they are. Now, the trap here is that people will spend too much time on the setup. You want to actually kind of get through the setup pretty quickly and then get into the meat of your story. So I'm going to try to demo this with a story about Jerry Kaplan. By the way, I'm going to credit this story to uh, Chip and Dan Heath. I found it in their really excellent book on communication called Made to Stick. So here's my version of this story. Um, 1987, Sand Hill Road, the purse strings of Silicon Valley. This is where everything was happening. 29-year-old Jerry Kaplan sat in the lobby of Kleiner Perkins. Kleiner Perkins is the most storied VC firm in the Valley. And he had a great idea for a new type of computer that was more like a book than a typewriter. They used a pen, not a mouse. And it was at that moment that he sat in that office with his great idea that he realized he had made a huge mistake. That's the setup. That's a much, an, as much information as you ba basically need. There's a little bit of a hook in there to sort of draw you in with that question of like, what do you mean he made a huge mistake? What happened next? That's act one. I want to try to keep that a little bit on the shorter side. Act two. Rising action, this is where everything happens. And uh, the, the key here is that as you build tension and, and it sort of rises to a climax, what's actually happening for your hero is that their fortunes are declining. Everything is getting worse for them. Uh, this is the main part of your story. And this is where business stories tend to falter because, uh, and I think it's because most of us in a business situation don't want to really introduce uh, suggestions about our company not looking good or me not looking good. It's a, we want to sort of paint a nice picture. But here's the problem. If you tell a story that's all roses and sunshine and everything's great, nobody cares. Stories need conflict. So you have to find a way to introduce conflict that's going to draw people in and make them care. So back to Jerry. What was Jerry's giant mistake? Well, here's the thing. Jerry thought this was just going to be a simple get to know you sort of conversation. He walked in, he was wearing jeans, he had a polo shirt on, uh, top siders, no socks, and he had nothing more in his hand but a leather maroon folder with a blank sheet, with a blank uh, notepad inside, not even written on it. 
Next to him sat 80s, 80s, 80s guy. Had a power suit, had a power tie, pinstripe, like Wall Street red. His hair was perfect. His teeth were perfect, you know, like a, like a, like a, a talk show host. Next to him on the floor beside him was a, a projector with color slides, a shiny black briefcase. And that's when Jerry realized he had misread the situation and he was in way over his head. He was there to pitch this product and he had nothing but this. He just, he just wasn't ready. He started to sweat this a little bit. 80s guy gets called into the office. There's a glass wall there and Jerry can just sort of see into this glass wall from, see through this uh, glass wall from where he's sitting in the lobby. 80s guy strides in, he's super confident and he sets up his projector. He's doing his color slides, his teeth are flashing, his hair is perfect and he's just like killing it, right? Jerry's getting more and more nervous as he's watching the clock and thinking about when it's gonna be his turn. And then it gets even worse. He notices through that room that the executives on the other end of this conference table start hammering 80s guy with tough questions. He can see this is what's happening. 80s guy is getting more and more dejected and more and more heated. And you almost see him starting to turn red as he's trying to justify his, his idea. His hair starts to get out of place. And uh, Jerry's watching this and feeling like even more anxious that this guy that was so prepared uh, was just getting hammered and he didn't have anything to show up with. A little while later, 80s guy is ushered out of the room. He walks by dejectedly, dragging his copier along with him in his briefcase. Jerry sits there in silence for a few moments and is invited into the room for his turn. He walks in, he looks at the faces around him. They're not amused, they're not really particularly happy. Jerry starts in. <clears throat> he talks about this idea that he has for this computer and, and what it would be like and the whole idea that you could that you could walk around with this thing and uh, and and you wouldn't need to be tethered to your desk. You could do things like answer emails and interact with the world wherever you go. And use a pen, which would be way more natural than actually typing things in. And he talks about the technical challenges of how you'd actually make this so it could recognize handwriting and everything. And as he's looking at the faces, uh, he's really, it's just no expression. And, and he's just sure that this is getting worse and worse and worse. Finally, at his lowest moment, he'd kind of gone through this. He thinks at any moment, they're just gonna kick him out of the room. He has an inspiration, has a flash of an idea, and he kind of gets to that place where it's like, screw it. And he, he grabs the folder, the, just the leather folder with nothing in it. And he says, if I had walked in here with a PC, you sure as hell would know it, which you may not realize is that I have the future of computing in my hand right here. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the next revolution in computers. And he slammed it on the table. That's act two. Rising action right to that climax moment. And now you're on to act three. This is where everything resolves. And again, the kind of stories that we want to look for, this is when uh, ideally it resolves to something that's positive, but you need to set it up so it's tough for this person. So what happened? In that silence that seemed like it lasted forever, it's probably only a few seconds, but in Jerry's head, feeling the sweat, it probably felt like 30 seconds longer. Finally, Brooks Briers, who's one of the younger partners in the firm, Kleiner Perkins, reaches over, he grabs the folder and slides it toward him, towards him. He kind of looks at it, picks it up and looks at it and says, um, how much info could you store on this? John Doerr, who's sitting next to him, says, you know, you, you don't need to worry about that. Moore's Law, it's getting cheaper and, and, and everything's getting smaller. We don't have to even think of it. And then Vinod Kosla, I think is how you say his name. He became the CEO of Sun Microsystems after this little while. He talks to John and he says, yeah, but bear in mind, handwriting technology, that's a big deal. Before Jerry knows it, it's almost like he's not in the room. They keep discussing his idea and they keep doing it with this in their hands. They're passing around this thing that is not like any sort of prototype, certainly not what 80s guy would have walked in with. They're passing it around. At that point, Jerry realized this is actually going great. A couple of days later, they called him up and they decided to back his project and they valued his non-existent company at four and a half million dollars. It became Go Computers, but uh, which did great. And a lot of that technology that was developed then is still in use in tablets today. So there you go three-act structure. 
spend that time in the middle, introduce some conflict and uh, have it resolve into something that feels hopeful. That's a great business story. Let's look at uh, three tips around it. And then I'll have a quick check-in with Carly and then we'll look at specific business situations where you might use this. So here's the, the, the three tips. The first one, oh, I forgot to uh, say that. Yeah, best is when it involves growth for the hero. You want, it, ideally, somebody has to overcome something. So in the case of Jerry Kaplan, he needed to really step into the shoes of someone who could pitch an idea, not just come up with a great idea. He needed to, to step up to that moment. Okay, here is your tips. <clears throat> Man bites dog. You look for something to flip the script, to just um, make an impact that people are not expecting. You want to try to surprise them. I read a story once about a sales trainer in the 90s who, was, who would start all of his uh, trainings by saying, hello, I'm Joe Smith, and these are not my pants. Uh, evidently, what happened is that he had lost his pants and one of the hotel clerks had lent him a pair of his pants. But it's a surprising way to start. You want to find those moments of surprise and you want to look for them throughout your story. It doesn't mean need to be just in the beginning, but you want those moments that get people thinking, huh, that like what happened next? Suspense. We've been talking about this a little bit already in terms of the questions and posing those questions and answering them, that what happens next feeling. Well, here's a little trick that you can use. Use time to create that sense of urgency. Um, but the, for Jerry Kaplan, he's sitting there and you know that he's going to have to go into that office and time is slowly clicking away and he's getting more and more anxious. You can use time to create suspense. You can also withhold information. Set up an idea, but don't give people the answer just yet. Stretch out that tension. Tension is super important for getting people interested in your story. And then the last one, and we kind of talked about this a little bit already, is emotion. Uh, here's a framework that actually comes from another book I will recommend called Sell with a Story by Paul Smith. And these are three different ways that you can add emotion into your story. One, you can just tell somebody what the emotion was. You could say, for example, uh, Jerry just felt super nervous at that point and really anxious. You can show people what the emotion was. So that would be describing the sweat that's coming down uh, Jerry's face and, and, and uh, describing what it is instead of actually naming the emotion. And then the final one is to just make people feel it. And I'll give you an example that comes from Ernest Hemingway. Some of you may have heard of this before. It's, it's become a thing called six word stories. So supposedly he wrote this story back in 1925 and it's only six words. And here's how it goes. Baby shoes for sale. Never worn. It's a whole story in six words that gives you the picture of a family that basically lost their child. And if a story, if even in six words, you can get people to feel something rather than just say the, say the words, that's a, that's a powerful way to grab people on that emotional level. So I, I, next up, I have some recommendations for where and when you could tell a business story. But let me just check in uh, first with you really quickly, Carly. Is there anything we should address um, I know we're coming up on questions pretty soon, so you you tell me. Yeah, I think we could um, kind of embed a good question from Stephen. Um, he he's asking a little bit around how do you effectively communicate a story if your command um, over the audience is maybe not as or he used the example of the Star Wars example of um, if your command over the lexicon is not as great as your audience. So if you're talking to um, maybe a foreign audience or someone that speaks a different language as you, where there might be communication kind of barriers to begin with. Yeah. Yeah, that's a really good one. So, so first off, you have to be really sensitive to the audience that you're talking to. For example, the story uh, about the golf guy. You don't want to tell a, a sports story in a lot of situations. That that it depends on, on the situation. Uh, making references to something like Star Wars can be super problematic because some people might not know it. But in that case, if you can find uh, just a general story about anybody that others could relate to, this is the story of of Betty who worked at a, at uh, Eden Housing. And, you know, was really dedicated to trying to do great work for people. Here's the kind of work that they did. And then you could describe what the challenges that she was facing in her own life. You can set up a scenario that people can relate to, and you do want to default to that. When you're working with people that have, uh, if there's some sort of language barrier, then you want to do the same thing you kind of always want to do, which is default to simple uh, 
more simple language. Uh, you, you use if there's a choice between two words and one is more complicated, <clears throat> use the easier to understand one always. And just slow down your delivery. Just slow down your delivery. Give, give people time to process what you're saying. Let me jump into these business story situations because this is kind of where everything's pointing to, right? And I, I, do, I do feel like it's important to bring this up because often I see people think that the only place they can tell a story is a customer story. And it's usually just a customer success story. But you can tell other customer stories. You could tell a cautionary customer story. You could tell a customer story that's really about here's somebody that was very similar to you and here's how things went. There's, <clears throat> there's more opportunities when it comes to customer stories than just the here's a here's a great success origin stories so uh we're familiar uh, some of us may be with origin stories like southwest airlines that started their business plan that uh, by just something that fit on the back of a napkin or apple starting in steve jobs's garage his parents garage actually so origin stories are great but they don't need to be just about origins uh, you can create a story from any place in the company culture and stories want to upgrade based on the situation they're not set in stone those stories about your organization for example in the 1990s ups needed to upgrade what they were doing they've kind of like seen the the end of what they were doing well and <clears throat> they were com facing competition that was going <clears> to <throat> mean that they needed to innovate more than just lean into what they had always done, which was just be super efficient. So what they did to sell internally everyone on this idea that they were innovative, is they needed to go back and revisit their own story. And they needed to call out those things that were in their DNA in the beginning. Like, for example, they started out with bicycles, not with trucks, and they moved to that. They uh, bought their own cargo airlines, and they were one of the first ones to do web-based tracking. So there was actually a history of innovation. They needed to call that out, feature it in a way that was authentic and compelling so people could feel like, oh, okay, that is us, as they tried to make that change. Your stories um, can, can keep living. You can keep finding them for a company. Uh, here's another one. Why you stories? Uh, this is why you personally. Why should I work with you? This can be the story of why you do what you do. And I don't mean just, uh, you know, that you're making money from it or whatever, but like what gets you up every day to go to work? What do you care about? It can be a story about you working with a customer. It could be a story about a time that you did something that wasn't right for a customer and what you did to fix it, to show uh, credibility, to give people a reason to trust you. There's actually a lot of opportunity there. And then the final story is actually not your story, but get the people that you're talking to to tell you their stories. I find this really impactful. If I can get a conversation going with any uh, customer, whether it's internal or external, and I can move us away from just pure facts, information, and data into a conversation that has stories involved, I get a much clearer picture of what's going on. I get more understanding. Um, uh, so that's, that's another invitation there, is to get people to tell you stories. There you go. That's my presentation. Uh, Carly, what sort of uh, questions do we have uh, from, from the group? Thank you so much, Darren. Um, awesome, we have another interesting question from, uh, I think, Lakshmi, excuse me if I'm pronouncing it wrong, Lakshmi, but um, her, his or her question is, can I help, um, how can I lead or tell a story to help resolve a conflict um, between team members using a story? So using storytelling to resolve conflict. That's a really good one. Um, I, I think that, well, first off, you need to kind of get the stage so people are listening to you. So in order to get the stage, they have to hear that you understand their story first. So essentially, I'm not, if, I'm, if I'm doing this and I'm, and, I'm, and I'm hearing back not just their data, you know, who said what, but like what their experience is, what their story is, then I create opportunity for me to talk about it. At that point, what I want, might want to look for is a story that feels similar about how two different uh, groups who were in conflict came together. It'd have to make a very clear point. Um, but it might be a, a template that you could use uh, as sort of a foundation for working on your, your, um, on a solution. 
I think, I think that's fascinating. That's sort of my first thought about it. But in that particular case, I think the most important thing is to make sure that you're eliciting somebody else's story, not just their information. So you can tell them back what their story is, not just their data. You know, uh, here's how you feel. Here's what it was like for you. Here's the situation that you were confronted in and show that you get it. Doesn't mean you agree with it, but you, you can recognize their story. Uh, other questions, concerns, thoughts, pushback, you know, or, uh, you know, does somebody have a ghost story that they wish I told? Um, we had another question from Lars that's kind of interesting of, of, say you're, you know, and kind of reflecting around how to reinforce the story you're telling, um, how you can kind of do that, whether it's like through merchandising or it kind of gets more into like the business case for telling a story or maybe influencing people with your story, but um, Lars is kind of getting at reflecting on how you maybe market that or, or merchandise it or things like that if you're if you're trying yeah. to re reinforce the story. Yeah, uh, that's a good question. <clears throat> I um, so I, I'm actually not a marketer. I feel like there's probably people that could get to answer it from a marketing perspective maybe a little bit better but I, I've been surprised at how often I've been called in to help people build a story after they already have the marketing they already have the language but what they don't have is they don't have people telling enough of the same story that supports the marketing the marketing itself wants a reinforcement from everybody that's part of that organization uh, in, in more in the shape of stories that supports the main message and uh, uh, my one recommendation there having done that is that you don't want everybody in your team telling exactly the same story like they're on a, a, a script for a cold call or something. What, what you want is a story that feels authentic to each person, but supports what that overall message is from your company. Um, then, of course, from a marketing perspective, you just want to make that everything, every, you want to make sure that everything feels like it's supporting um, a message. I hope I did okay there. Um, other thoughts? Questions, concerns? Thank you. Um, this is an interesting one, more around um, kind of storytelling in a home setting. How do you cal calibrate a story to communicate the message to children um, with parents, so with parents in the audience? So how do you communicate stories as a parent? I think, and Stephen, correct me if I'm, if I'm interpreting your question. That is awesome, which actually reminds me of Leanne, our visitor, who was, I think, four, we said. I don't know if she stayed with us, but I'd be so curious to hear if she like followed um, any of it, what she thought. Um, <clears throat> uh, I mean, I, it, it, anytime that you have an audience that's mixed, uh, which we often find ourselves in, I need to convey a message to a large group that come from different departments, they have really different concerns, or maybe it's in some other external situation. I need to tell a story that includes a little bit of everybody. In the same way that if I was talking to a very large group, I was presenting on the stage to 500 people, I want to break the audience up into chunks. I don't need to speak to every single person. But I want to break that audience up into like, you know, four or five chunks and kind of speak to them at different points, not in a, in a, in an order, like you're a, um, you know, a, 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 what do you call it? A sprinkler, <laughs> but you want to sort of mix it up, but you want to speak to different concerns at different moments. And all you need to do is get the general gist of it for people to feel like you're talking to them. So if I can include a little bit that's for kids, if I can include a, uh, include a little bit that's for adults and make sure that it's not um, affecting people negatively back and forth, that's all I need to do to keep everybody there. As long as they have that feeling of suspense and wanting to know what happens next, they'll wait for what's for them just a little bit. So that's my, that's my proposition there. Thanks, Darren. Um, we also have a, we had a question around, um, I think from Paul around, uh, or maybe it was Roel, Roel, um, around like storytelling as being an interviewee. So telling a story when you're going through an interview, um, like I always think of the, like, tell me about yourself. The, I feel like that's kind of an invitation to tell a story, but, uh, yeah, I 100% agree. I think if you can, uh, tell a story rather than just give a bunch of data, I think that's great. Uh, the thing that I would do in that situation is make sure that I didn't have a story that was too long. And I would also try to find opportunities to get the interviewer to tell me stories, to talk about the stories that I 
to almost try to tell the story of that organization in my research around you. Here's some of the things that I see and, and like, like tell the organization story. You have all kinds of opportunities to tell stories in that situation. Um, here's the other thing that I see often about people in business setting when they're telling stories is that they feel pressure to be fast because they don't want to take too much time with the story. And when you rush yourself telling a story, it actually feels like it takes forever. So really the key is to take your time, add enough detail in, add those things like the suspense and the emotion so that people are drawn in and um, make it all feel valuable. Should you tell a half hour story in an interview? No way. <laughs> But you could probably get away with a five minute story if it didn't feel like a five minute story, it just felt really interesting and engaging. And that's what you're going for. Um, yeah, don't leave the important bits out to try to make it short. If you just, well, I'll just only keep the data and the info in, your story is not going to be good. You got to get the emotion, the suspense, um, those, the color. You need to paint a picture for people. And last thing, you can't go too far. I actually really risk going too far with painting the picture of an uh, 80s guy. I put in a lot of details. You don't really need, need to do that. You could have just said like a, like a couple of details, a black shiny briefcase and a big giant hair. Um, you know, that, that would have been enough. Um, if you do too much, you rob people of using their own imagination. Other thoughts? Thank you, Darren. Uh, we had a request for you to tell a Halloween story. Um, so if you have any kind of fun thing to close for Halloween, we can do that. Uh, okay, so I don't have a Halloween story, but here's what I think we could do uh, with just like, we, I know we have a, a video to show. Do we have like two minutes, Carly? We do, yeah, we'd say we have about two minutes. All right, great. So here's what I propose that we do. We will have a bad joke competition. And the, the winner is the one who can tell a Halloween joke. So you get bonus points for a Halloween joke. I'll start, I'll tell one, and then we'll see who has a joke. Now notice right now what I'm doing is I'm giving everyone time to Google search a bad joke. The only rule with the bad joke is it can't be me. So here's my super dumb bad joke. I'm setting the bar super low. What has two knees and swims in the ocean? I'll tell you what, to make it uh, Halloween-y, I'll do it with my vampire accent. So what has two knees and swims in the ocean? Do you want to know? I'll tell you, a tuny fish. That's right, a tuny fish. Tuny swims in the ocean, a tuny fish. So I set the bar super low. Uh, Carly, do we have any volunteers who could tell a dumb joke and bonus points for if it's a Halloween joke? And if we need to call on somebody, I'm sure we could call on Marissa, uh, who I, I believe is probably Googling jokes right now, but who has a good joke? We have about a minute, 30 seconds left. <laughs> Let's see. Uh, Luvia has when she says she has a pizza joke, but it's kind of cheesy. So. <laughs> uh, is that the whole joke right there or is there more? <laughs> Luvia, if you want to come off, you can. No, that was it. <laughs> that was the joke. Yeah, that was good. I like that. That's a good, it's a perfect joke for a chat too, because it's not too long. Marissa, we're giving you tons of time to research a bad joke I, I online. Have, I don't even need to research. This is sad. I'm full of bad jokes. All right, um, good. Let's hear it. Why couldn't COVID go to the bar? Why? Because COVID was 19. <laughs> <laughs> All right, good. I think that's uh, that feels like a, like a pretty good capper to me, Carly. What do you think? Yeah, I think I think that sounds great. Um, thanks, thanks Marissa. Uh, making some light of our of our current current situation. Um, now we're getting all sorts of ones in, but um, we'll have we'll have more time and discussion um, available actually in our community, our online community um, that Learned is actually just launching called Offsite. So I'll put the link to join Offsite um, in here. Again, it's it's our platform for um, our community to stay connected. We've been really excited to grow these sessions um, over the last six months. And so this new platform will kind of let us stay connected and you can chat with Darren in there uh, and also find out about future sessions uh, and future, future events. So I'll chat that in there and feel free to reach out to me um, and or Darren uh, after this session with questions uh, and follow up. We, we're happy to follow up with you. Um, and with that, I am going to share my screen and my sound. And um, let me see here.
Give me one moment, everybody. Thank you. Another another quick thing is we have um, we have some workshops coming up that kind of speak to similar topics to uh, what we covered today. So we have a session um, on PowerPoint psychology and tips around PowerPoint presentations. So um, that class is kind of a blend of storytelling, but also how to you know technically use you know use effective imagery and everything in your slides. Uh, for that, and we have a couple of other sessions. So um, when you join our online community, you get 10% off of these workshops as well. So um, again, chat me or email me and we can we can discuss opportunities uh, to keep learning and, and uh, engaging. So uh, with that, I wanna close with uh, a video from Eden Housing around the work they're doing um, and we'll go from there. So just give me a thumbs up, Alyssa, when if you can hear the sound. I'm hoping we can hear the sound here. We're about a place that welcomes people from all walks of life, all economic backgrounds. For the people that are disenfranchised or lower income or somehow disadvantaged in our society, we must make allowance for them. And I think it even we really take that very seriously. Home is the place that you go where you have real security, where you feel like you're safe, where you feel like you're surrounded by community and by people who support you. And so when we think about the homes that we build, we really try to think about how do we provide that for our residents? Very easy to talk. A place where your kids can walk to school safely. What does it mean to have a home? We're living in a time where it's very easy to talk about people in ways that polarize us. But I believe, and I think all of us even believe, that it starts with where you live, but where you're born can change your outcomes. I think that we have a role in leading a different dialogue. And you do that by telling the story of the people that we work with and the communities that we've changed. Thank you so much, everybody. Um, Alyssa and I will be around for the last two minutes uh, to, if you have any questions around Eden Housing, um, I'll also put the, the link for donation uh, in the chat as well. Um, but thank you so much to everyone for being here. And thank you, Darren, for a really, really engaging session. Um, I really enjoyed today. So thank you so much. Thanks everybody. So your COVID joke was ahead. I know. People like the COVID <laughs> joke. That was good. And also the recording of this session will be available in offsite as well. Um, and you can also find it on our YouTube channel. So if you want to go back to the session and refer to it, um, also for people that maybe missed a little bit, logged on late, that'll be available in offsite and on YouTube.